Hello friends, this is Sanjay. In this video series, we will cover the interpretation of statute subject from the LLB syllabus of Chaudhary Charan Singh University or CCSU Meerut. The syllabus is common for both the 3 year and 5 year LLB programs. The complete playlist is available on the Lawment YouTube channel. While I have covered all the topics which are specifically mentioned in the syllabus, I have also included some additional concepts and topics which are required for a better understanding of the subject and also helpful if you are preparing for any post LLB exams like the CLAT PG, UGC NET or judicial services. The timestamps for the specific topics as per the syllabus are in the description below. This is part 5 and we will talk about presumptions in statutory interpretation. The first question is what are presumptions? Now presumptions are the basic expectations with respect to the legislative intent and the operation of statutes. In simple words, presumptions are some basic expectations which are based on common sense and fairness and the principles of natural justice. These uh, expectations or presumptions are used in every step of the interpretation of statutes. For example, if a statute is clear and unambiguous, then there is no need for interpretation. It should be implemented or enforced as is. If there is a need for interpretation, then the primary principles are applied first, such as uh, the literal rule, the golden rule, etc. If required, the secondary principles are applied next to fine-tune the interpretation that was done through the primary rules. Here, the presumptions are applied at every step of the interpretation process. For example, there is the presumption of constitutionality, which is the presumption that uh, the legislature would not have intentionally created any statutes to violate the constitution. If a statute, as per its uh, literal text, appears to violate the constitution, then interpretation is required. When the primary principles are applied and there are two or more possible interpretations of the statute, then the versions which violate the constitution should be immediately discarded. Same with the secondary principles. After applying these uh, principles, if there are multiple possible interpretations of the statute, then any version which appears to violate the constitution should be ignored. Even while implementing or enforcing the statute, if there is any violation of the constitution, then go back to step 1 and reinterpret the statute again. As I mentioned, these presumptions are based on some common sense and basic legal principles. And because the constitution is the highest rule book of the country, it is common sense and a basic legal principle that the legislature can make laws within the power granted by the constitution and not violate the constitution itself. In one of my other videos, I have briefly discussed an extensive list of 25 different presumptions in statutory interpretation. However, not all of them are included in the university syllabus. So here we will discuss in depth the presumptions that are specifically included in your syllabus. If you want to get an overview of all these 25 presumptions, I will include a link to that video in the description below. Presumption as to jurisdiction. Here the courts will presume that a statute has jurisdiction over all matters or on all persons within the territory, unless the statute specifies a limitation or an exception. For example, the courts will assume that the GST Act is applicable on all goods and all services across India, unless the Act itself or the rules made thereunder allow for some limitations or exceptions. And if you look at it, the rules under the GST Act do allow for some exemptions to small and petty businesses or on specific items like agricultural produce where GST is not applicable. Similarly, the courts will assume that the Indian Forest Act is applicable uniformly across India, unless there are any specific limitations or exceptions that are mentioned by the government. And if you look at it, the Indian Forest Act does allow for some exceptions in the context of tribals, especially in states like Nagaland and Mizoram, where there may be some customs and traditions that may conflict with this statute. So the statute provides some exceptions. Presumption against what is inconvenient or absurd. This is a presumption based on common sense that the legislature will not make laws to intentionally create inconvenient or absurd situations. For example, if there is a road which says one way for all vehicles, a very strict and literal interpretation of the law or the rule may say that even kids on tricycles are not allowed on the road. But the courts will work with the presumption that such absurd situations were not the intention of the legislature which created the law. Therefore, kids 
who are riding tricycles might not be punished for violating the one way rule presumption against intending injustice here the courts will presume that the legislature does not intentionally enact a statute that leads to an injustice or unfair results of course most laws may lead to some kind of inconvenience to some people but the primary aim of the law will be a greater good or a greater benefit to a larger number of people so while interpreting any statutes the courts will first try to minimize the injustices or the negative consequences of the law for example in the 1980s there was a situation where the authorities wanted to evict the people who had occupied the footpaths or encroached on public lands in mumbai obviously the intent behind the evicting the people from the footpaths could be that uh, the occupation of the footpaths was leading to pedestrians having to walk on the roads and this was leading to a lot of accidents or traffic jams or it could even be that the occupation of the footpaths was negatively affecting the businesses in that area so the clearing of the footpath was for a greater good of a larger number of people and it was being done as per the law this is when a journalist called uh, olga telis who was working with the indian express at that time filed a petition on behalf of the pavement dwellers challenging the eviction on the grounds that it was violating the right to life and the right to livelihood in the judgment the court held that while the law is correct and the action under the law is also correct evicting people during the monsoon season was an injustice and ordered that the evictions should happen only after the monsoon season had ended presumption regarding the prospective operation of statutes typically indian laws are interpreted to apply to actions or to transactions that occur after the law takes effect rather than affecting those actions or transactions that took place before the law came into force for example if a law was passed on the 1st of december of 1999 that smoking in public places is a punishable offense and the law comes into force from the 1st of january of the year 2000 then people who are caught smoking in public places on or after the 1st of january of 2000 can be prosecuted and punished but people who were smoking in public places on 31st of december or before should not be prosecuted or punished in other words laws are generally assumed to be applicable only on actions or transactions that occurred after the law came into force that is prospective operation and not retrospective operation article 20 of the constitution specifically prohibits the retrospective operation of criminal laws so a person cannot be punished for doing something that was not illegal before the act came into force a point to be noted here is that the constitution does not prohibit the retrospective operation of civil laws therefore civil liabilities can be enforced or uh, taxes can be levied on past transactions however if there are any penal provisions that is punishments in that civil law these penal provisions cannot be enforced retrospectively that is on past transactions or on past actions the presumption against violation of international law says that unless there is a clear intention to do so the indian parliament will not normally pass any laws that violate international law especially if india is a signatory to the convention the treaty the agreement or the declaration that is being potentially violated so while interpreting any indian law if there are multiple interpretations that are possible the court will choose the option that upholds india's international commitments and not violate international laws typically we can see examples of this in human rights laws because indian laws may be modeled on the basis of international human rights declarations and covenants or we see examples in commercial law and intellectual property rights because india is a signatory to several international agreements or treaties and also a member of the world trade organization and also in the area of environmental laws where again india is an active participant in several international conventions and declarations while interpreting human rights laws indian courts will choose the option that aligns with international instruments like the universal declaration of human rights and uh, the international covenant on civil and political rights similarly interpretation of trade laws and ipr laws will be aligned with india's obligations under the wto and other agreements and uh, environmental laws are interpreted to uphold india's commitments under international conventions like the unfccc a couple of other points to remember about this presumption 
are that it is not absolute which means that if even after interpretation an indian law explicitly contradicts international law then the indian law will prevail and also there may be situations where the parliament intentionally passes a law that contravenes or violates international law even here the indian law will prevail for example if there is a pandemic and india needs to urgently produce some vaccines that are patented by foreign companies then the parliament can pass a law allowing indian companies to manufacture such vaccines even if this leads to violation of international intellectual property agreements that india is a part of of course such intentional violations of international law are done in extremely rare situations only with that we will end this video if you have any questions or feedback post a comment below and i will see you soon in the next video take care and jai hind